The concept for the flying wing began on November 22, 1941, when the United States Army Air Force wanted a bomber that could carry 10,000 pounds of bombs at an altitude of 45,000 feet, a maximum distance of 10,000 miles, with a maximum speed of 450 miles per hour and a cruising speed of 275 miles per hour. The United States believed they would need it in case Germany captured Britain during World War II. This aircraft would end up being the YB-35. Engineering and design work began early 1942. However, the first flight of the YB-35 did not occur until over four years later on June 25, 1946. This design used propellers to push it. Thirteen YB-35s were ordered by the Army Air Force and two of them were converted to use eight Allison J-35 jet engines. Once the jet engines were installed, the YB-35 was renamed the YB-49. On June 5, 1948, the second YB-49 to be converted was at 40,000 feet north of Miroc Air Force Base undergoing stall recovering testing in this general area here. No one knows for sure exactly what happened. What they do know is that the bulk of the aircraft impacted here with a crew of five. The pilot was United States Air Force Major Daniel Hugh Forbes Jr. The co-pilot was United States Air Force Captain Glenn Walter Edwards. The flight engineer was United States Air Force Lieutenant Edward Lee Swindle. Civilian employee Charles H. LaFontaine. And civilian employee Claire C. Lesser. Lieutenant Swindle was a crew member on the B-29 that launched Chuck Yeager on his historical flight in the Bell X-1 when he broke the sound barrier on October 14, 1947. Portions of the wing structure were found two miles away from the main impact point. This suggests the breakup occurred at a very high altitude. It is believed both outer wing sections broke away from the airframe during the pullout from a dive after an intentional stall for stall practice recovery. This is where the main part of the aircraft impacted the ground. Right here. So here I am at the location. This is where the impact occurred. Look at that piece of the melted aircraft here. So there's definitely evidence of the crash right here. So this is where it happened. Definitely the location. You can already see the evidence, little tiny pieces of melted metal. So this memorial is in the correct place. The registry. And it looks like I can do this without the shadow getting in the way. There's pieces of the aircraft put in inside the registry. Oh yeah, it's loaded. It's loaded with aircraft parts. 
I think that's an excellent way to preserve the memory of this place and to make people realize that this is the actual spot where the impact occurred. Very nice. At the base of the flagpole, people have put up some fairly big pieces. I don't know if these are it, but they're these pieces, the, the, the monument has these pieces glued on there. There's a lot of nickels here. A lot of five cent pieces here. So I think that's a, a salute to the the five men that lost their lives on this tragic day. There's a couple of nickels here on the ground. I don't know if they fell off of the monument or if they were meant to be put there. And I'm gonna pick them up and put them up here. Out of respect for the five members that gave the ultimate sacrifice in the service of their country. This portion of the memorial has the names Major Daniel Forbes, Captain Glenn Edwards, that's the one they named Edwards Air Force Base after. Charles H. LaFontaine. Claire C. Lesser. And Lieutenant Ed Swindle. As I walked around the location, I began to notice a debris pattern. So right now I want to show you that you can't see the memorial over that rise, but it's right over there. And I just found this piece right here, and it even has a rivet in it. You can see right there. So that is a long way away, which highly suggests to me the aircraft was coming from that direction, or I would say the west, and impacted at a fairly steep angle, and debris actually literally blew up this way. Here's another piece even further away, much further away. So there you go. I think I found enough pieces to get a very good idea of what direction the aircraft was heading when it impacted the ground, but I still think it was at a very steep angle. But the speed at which it was going when it impacted the ground, all that kinetic energy blasted tiny pieces of debris all the way over here, over this little ridge. The memorial is hiding behind that ridge, but I'm literally finding pieces almost 600 feet away at least 500 feet, okay, I'll say 400 feet. And that only suggests that the aircraft was heading from that direction, this direction, and impacted at a steep angle, but was still able to blast debris all the way back here. So after going over everything, I feel fairly confident that the aircraft came from this direction, the wings probably snapped off over here somewhere, found them out over there. Aircraft came in at a fairly steep angle, impacted here. I'm not sure how steep, but steep enough to scatter debris about four, five, six hundred feet in that direction over that little rise. And I have found pieces, tiny pieces of debris here out in this direction, very tiny very sparse. I found pieces of debris out on the other side, very sparse. The majority of the debris is right in here, and then there's a lot of debris out in that direction, several hundred feet, which would highly suggest that the aircraft came from that direction at a fairly steep angle, impacted here, and the kinetic energy carried everything toward me in that direction and most of it that way, making a shape that is very similar to a leaf. This pattern made a shape similar to a leaf. 
This is a rough outline of where the pattern is. What I think this tells me is that they were on a compass heading of approximately 98 to 100 degrees. The portions of the wings that broke off were found about two miles from the crash site. If they were heading east, then those wing portions were found in this area here. In a newspaper article printed Sunday, June 6, 1948, an eyewitness named Dale C. Wilson of Alton, Illinois, said it seemed to explode at several hundred feet in altitude, then plunged towards the earth. Following the crash of the YB-49, Topeka Air Force Base in Kansas was renamed Forbes Air Force Base in honor of Major Daniel Forbes. In December 1949, Muroc Air Force Base was renamed Edwards Air Force Base in honor of Captain Glenn Edwards. There was not much information on this incident. I couldn't find any official reports or very detailed reports. The only thing engineers and pilots felt confident about was that the aircraft was overstressed in a stall recovery and it basically snapped the wings off. Much was learned from this incident and the concept of the flying wing was completely scrapped early in 1950. The last operational YB-49 was finally ordered scrapped on December 1st, 1953. The concept of the flying wing did not resurface until over 40 years later in 1987 with the B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber by Northrop. It was introduced in 1997 and has been flying ever since. This memorial is open to the public and I highly recommend you come and visit to pay your respects to the five crew members that lost their lives in that tragic accident on June 5th, 1948. So there you have it, right here on the Forrest Haggerty Channel, a brief history of the YB-49 No. 2 that crashed in the Mojave Desert on June 5th, 1948, taking the lives of its five crew members.